I guess I'll give myself a little bit more of an introduction, maybe. Um, I am Jordan Last. I graduated with a degree in computer science from Brigham Young University about a year ago. Uh, I guess I, I'm a full stack developer. I love all things. I think the web is one of the most powerful platforms for application development ever created. It just eats up everything that it touches. And uh, blockchain, I think, is another huge revolution coming. And they work really well together. And I'm an enthusiast, so a disclaimer, I'm not affiliated with Definity in any official capacity, though I'm very involved in the community. And I talk to the people. And they are happy that I'm giving this presentation tonight. So just to get some demographics, which we already got a little bit, how many people uh, have heard of Definity? A bit outside of maybe tonight. And me. <laughs> outside of me and outside of tonight. OK, so not very many. Perfect. Um, how many people are familiar with Bitcoin, Ethereum? I'm trying to see how technical. Proof of work, proof of stake. OK, so we're going to get really technical at the end. You know what? We're trying to challenge the audience here. So like, just give us your most like technical, hardcore you can. This is, this is blockchain dev. OK. Right? <laughs> All right. Not, not Dash. How do you open a wallet? We, we don't talk about the price of Bitcoin. Yes. We talk about like. <laughs> You know, solidity. We want to go hardcore here. Okay, let's go hardcore. <laughs> so please interrupt me with questions or comments and feel free to challenge what I say. I want to discuss this and have an excellent argument. Arguments are excellent and we can remain civil if we so choose. So I want to start off with a little bit about the internet. We'll go back to the roots, start um, from kind of the ground up, the history of the internet. Really, what is the internet? It is a means of communication. Communication of data in particular. It lets you send ones and zeros across a shared infrastructure from any machine in the world to any other machine. And it does this through a few core protocols. TCP IP being really the core, and there's a few others built around that. But really today, the vast majority of our internet or web applications are going to use TCP IP at their core. <coughs> and like I said, it allows you to pretty much literally connect any device in the world to any other device in the world, more or less. What's really notable about this is that we do it across shared infrastructure that's owned collectively by the entire world. Really, there's no single owner of the internet. No one owns the protocols, they're free and open. And the hardware infrastructure is owned by a major or, uh, various companies distributed across the world. When I'm sending my, let's say I open up my phone, go to google.com, who knows where that request is traveling? It could be traveling across state boundaries. It could be traveling across country boundaries. It could be traveling across continent boundaries. And it goes through different um, like legal jurisdictions and also uh, physical places and also different companies that are kind of relaying it all and I don't need to worry about any of that as an end user or as an application developer I just know that there's this giant shared infrastructure that allows me to communicate which is excellent uh, hold on so all these properties that we just talked about really we're describing a decentralized system in a decentralized system, you have no central point of failure. There is no one place you could bomb that would take out the entire internet, except bombing the Earth, like the whole thing. So, so can I yes. Interject? Yes. Yes. In this space, usually the term decentralization is used to refer to governance and control, mm -hmm. not distribution. So you can have a centralized, centrally controlled system that is highly distributed. Yes, I agree. But the internet, I think, is both. It's distributed and decentralized. There's no single entity. No, I, I'm just, oh, okay. You just said it was decentralized. Okay. So. Decentralized in, in, and actually, you could have said distributed, and it would have meant the same thing. 
Okay. So I think it's, the internet is distributed as well as decentralized. Except for the namespace. Well, yes. But I'm talking about, okay. yeah, yeah. The core protocol and the core of what it is, DNS is built on top of the internet protocols, right? Yeah. So there's no central point of failure. Uh, altogether, this thing has 100% uptime. Uh, I don't think there's been any point in the last 10 years that the entire internet has been down or in the last 20 years. Maybe 25, maybe even 30. I mean, you might get back to the originals where it might have been down entirely, but since it's been distributed enough, this thing has 100% uptime. And it offers extreme scalability. Started off with maybe a handful of users, moved up to tens, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. It's in the billions of users now, which is, I would say, extreme scalability. It provides censorship resistance. Uh, there's no, like, even if you're in China, the Great Firewall of China, there are ways to get around that. You can hook up to it different ways. You can use your physical landline to your house. If that doesn't work, go through the cell service. If that doesn't work, get a satellite connection. If that doesn't work, you can use DARPA net, which is TC, er, yeah, it's TCP IP, no, it's IP over ham radio, which works. And they used to do it, but it's really slow. Um, another amazing thing about decentralized shared systems like the internet is that it, greatly reduces platform risk. So if you're building your entire company off of a product that another company offers to you and it's a central integral piece of what you're doing, that produces an enormous risk potentially. Because that company could decide at any moment that that's not profitable for them and they can remove that piece of your business because they're the ones that own it. The internet, I think part of why it's become so successful is that it is a completely open platform. The platform risk is extremely low and that has allowed tons of companies to build on top of it without risking, or without the risk of it being pulled out from underneath them. So when I go to build any kind of networking application, be it a website, web app, any kind of thing like that, I can build on top of the core internet protocols and feel confident that that is not a huge risk um, that no one's going to pull it out from underneath me. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess. And a huge thing is that I am not responsible for this infrastructure. I don't need to sit down every time I'm making a new application and figure out how am I going to set up this physical infrastructure, how am I going to write these protocols so that I can communicate with other people. It's already been done. We all share it. It's extremely robust. It's excellent. Okay, the internet itself, that means of communication, is beautiful. It has helped a lot of things. Now we come to uh, the web, which is an innovation that was enabled by the internet. And really at, at its core, what I believe is the web allows you to put user-facing applications on top of the internet. Uh, so you build on top of that data communication layer that's already there for you and it allows you to hook into the network of networks, which is what the internet is. It's a network of networks. It lets you hook into private infrastructure, which provides a few things that the internet itself doesn't provide you. And that's computation on your data and storage of your data. So the internet itself does not compute anything for you. All it does is send data across point to point, more or less. It doesn't store data for you either. It's not going to give you persistent storage. So if you have an application where you have tons of people using it and you want to make sure that data that they put into the system is there the next day and that anyone can access at any time, which many of our scalable web apps need to do, the internet doesn't give you that. But the web, more or less, has allowed that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll explain how that happens. Um, well, no, this next slide should get that. It's centralized. That's how it happens. Centralization did it. Web hosting 
if you think of where you're going to store all of your static assets or anything you're going to deliver to your clients, where are you going to do it? You're going to do it on some kind of centralized service. Yeah, but you could argue that web hosting is also decentralized in the same way that you argue that companies that own parts of the infrastructure are all different companies across the world. I mean, there are different companies that own web hosting platforms. Um, you don't have to go with just one, so it's not really centralized by that, that criteria. Uh, true, but this kind of centralized, so web hosting, you're actually giving something you own to a company, that company can literally change it, censorship, cen censor it, and shut it down. Whereas if I'm sending data across, especially if it's HTTPS encrypted, no one, there's, like, you don't, you don't lose some of the properties of decentralized. So it might be. So the actual internet consists of a very few centralized routing centers like Chicago. If you drop an atom bomb on that building on Chicago, it would take down the internet. It would take down the whole internet. It would, it would maybe slow things down. I mean, you have enough yeah, clubs. Yeah, you, can't, you have to take out, um, but, but, they, but, like, they, but it would have to take out like thousands of different right, things. Right, exactly. but, 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 it's, but it's sufficiently centralized that it would not, no longer function. Just like when we lost, you know, Cloudflare had a problem. Somebody fat fingered Amazon and lost. You know, you know, there's been failures where a significant percentage of the internet has gone out for periods of time. So, 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 architecturally, using the term centralized, decentralized, when you say the web is decentralized, you're, you're using it in, in a way that is web hosting. I agree. Web hosting is, is every bit as decentralized as the web is in that term because there's lots of web hosts. They're in different domains. They're in different data centers. If, if you took out Bluehost, it would take out a whole bunch of people, but you know, Greenhost and you know, the dozens of others hosts will still survive. So, so that's a... Would you say it's a continuum though, Sam? Like, yeah. It's not like it's either decentralized or decentralized. Yeah. It's sort of like... It, it's a mix. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so, so the point is a little bit... You're, you're, you're overstating the, the case, right? It, you could be more decentralized. Okay. But if you atom bomb the Chicago thing, yeah. wouldn't all the other routers use their routing algorithm and IP would start and it would fix itself? Well, it would eventually. So it's not a central point of failure fully, I guess. Well, but I mean, uh, if, if I'm on a VoIP call that drops a call, if I'm doing a bank transfer, yeah, sure. you, know, you would have you know, a, a wave of failures. You would start to have packet swarms in data centers. You would have all sorts of things that might take hours to resolve. It would, but it's not but that's the it's not decentralized. Yeah, it's not it's decentralized. Like, the notion of a decentralized network is that um, it works around failures, right? So like, if there's a failure in the network, then there are other Yeah, so, so the internet routing protocol is a, is a mesh protocol. It's a self-human protocol. It'll eventually fix, it, fix itself. Um, and web hosting won't fix itself necessarily. Well, if, if I'm if I'm Bluehost and I just decide I don't want to host for you anymore, that doesn't fix itself. Well, it doesn't fix itself for the people that have Bluehost. Exactly, and and the same thing with Chicago. Only the people who are routing through Chicago are affected by that, which might be tons of people, but I don't know. I think it's a valid point. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, let's talk about. Cool. Uh, did you have something to say, Brandon? Okay, okay. So the point is, web hosting, which I'm saying is centralized, provides you with computation and storage, which you don't get in the core internet protocols. And you have huge companies like Amazon Web Services, Google, and Azure, and others that are providing you this cloud hosting and cloud computation. And, and that is more centralized. 70% okay. of all web services Amazon provides. So, we, yes, yep. They have the control. Um, you don't have shared infrastructure necessarily anymore for your computation and your storage. You have to, if I'm gonna use AWS, there's probably AWS specific configurations I need to do. And if I try to move from platform to platform, I'll have to switch between all those, figure all that out. Things, there are, there's software to help you like Kubernetes or probably others as well, serverless framework but you're still gonna have to figure it all out. You have a central point of failure. 
not necessarily 100% of time extreme scalability, it could still be pretty scalable. It, I mean, it, it is, I would say. So that, that's not a good point. All, kind of all the things that you, all the benefits of a decentralized system and a centralized system you don't have. And I would point out that it is a spectrum, like you said. Um, so the three key requirements I would say for useful, useful computer systems at scale, like we've been talking about, is this, it looks really weird from here. Um, you need communication of data, you need to store your data somewhere, and you need to compute on your data. That computation can happen in a variety of places, but it needs to happen on clients or servers. I'm proposing that communication's already decentralized very well through the internet, but storage and computation are very centralized. Okay, this brings us to Definity. I wanted to have Batman music playing when this is like, so Definity builds on top of decentralized communication. It uses TCP IP to do its communication through um, for, from node to node. And it provides us decentralized computation and it provides us decentralized storage. So Definity, yes. So how is there So um, first off, to go back to your point in the beginning about how Ethereum's gonna suck stuff in, Definity has stated that they're not necessarily a competitor to Ethereum. They kind of think of them as sister networks. Um, they love Ethereum, they have learned from them, and I'm sure they hope that Ethereum learns from Definity, which it already has. Um, we're gonna get to unmanipulable, unpredictable randomness that Definity kind of has pioneered. And Ethereum is pulling pieces of that in, as well as other major blockchains. And so, oh, how is it different? Definity is going to be just way, much more scalable. And it's gonna actually allow you to, instead of, so imagine AWS, but a decentralized version. That's what Definity is gonna be. And right now, at least, Ethereum definitely does not provide that. It's way too expensive, way too slow, and yeah, but I mean, do you, and I don't know if you know, do you have any ideas like on how technically they're achieving this? Mm -hmm. Because what I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of in order to get AWS level like support everywhere, I'm thinking of running a node right now, an Ethereum node, that we're just going to say this, this uh, on the not going to just gigabytes on Ethereum node, this these days. For a full node, you need them all, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering, are they saying that like, if, and they're not really doing storage. Yes, they are doing storage, but like very like low amounts of storage. High amounts of storage. They're saying things like you won't need databases. Well, no, I'm saying Ethereum. Oh, Ethereum. Yes. Ethereum does low amounts of storage. Yep, you're right. And so you're, are you, are, is Definity expecting people to run full nodes with, say Ethereum is doing low amounts of storage and it's going to do high amounts of storage. So they're going to be running those like 500 gigabytes. Um, I'm not sure about so that. The storage is hard to encrypt in engineering on the blockchain, right? Yeah. You could theoretically do that, but it would be like horrendous, you know? So, so usually, yeah, so usually they'll do something like FS and then they'll just store hashes to where it's yeah. stored. Mm -hmm. And I, what I'm wondering is if they are doing that same thing or if they are actually trying to build so so you know it themselves. So do your slides cover all these questions? We're going to get into the consensus algorithm. We're not going to get into the hypervisor and the instruction set, which is probably where most of the actual computation questions would happen. They haven't really come out with official documentation on that yet. So it's kind of hearsay-ish. Um, yeah. But they're using WebAssembly. The virtual machine's going to be written in WebAssembly. 
and um, they've spoken about things like having a crypto black box that will allow you to run private computations on chain and it, whatever's running cannot be penetrated by anyone else who has access and stuff like that. So the actual, I don't know. Uh, they really haven't come out with much information. I, I, I sure hope that they do. I'm so excited for homomorphic encryption. So yeah, the computation at the basic level, it's going to be WebAssembly. I mean, eWASM. So Ethereum and Definity are similar in that aspect. But beyond that, I'm not exactly sure. But the consensus algorithm we will get into, and that's, I'll show you how that is much more scalable than proof of work, but obviously Ethereum will be improving itself, so. Okay, Definity offers decentralized computation, decentralized storage, and gives you a lot of those properties of decentralized system, and really essentially it becomes an unstoppable compute resource that we all share together. Essentially, we're extending the internet and giving it what it never had. It didn't have computation and it didn't have storage in its core protocols. But Definity, the internet computer, is going to add that to the um, trifecta of what the internet can do. So I'm imagining, this is kind of my personal view, educated view though, at some future point, we're all going to be able to use the internet as our entire backend. We'll be able to write our business logic and deploy it to an unstoppable backend that has excellent security, that has amazing scalability, and all of that time that we waste, more or less, trying to figure out how we're gonna scale solutions and to use, whether to use AWS Lambdas to do it, or Kubernetes, or just a EC2 instance, or all that stuff, will just go away. More or less. Well, one would possibly argue that won't quite go away because of the other blockchains that say we do it better just the same way that it's Kubernetes and another system that say we do it best. So you still have to kind of make those decisions. Yes, to that point, my personal belief is that just like we consolidated around the IP, TCP IP protocols, I think we're going to consolidate around a world computer solution. Could I respond to that? I think it seems to me like you could still have a flourishing of um, several different flavors of uh, decentralized like storage and computing layers um, because they're all just like overlays on top of the existing in in internet infrastructure. So it's not like you have to adopt one standard or the other, even though maybe we'll start to see consolidation around a certain standard. Um, as long as both of those things are robust, you might see for a long, long time several different um, ways. It kind of in the same way that like I can choose whether I want to build my web application in my backend in Elixir or Ruby on Rails or a bunch of other things, uh, uh, JavaScript or whatever, Node.js. I mean, it might be similar where I can choose Definity or I can choose Mainframe because we're actually doing something very similar. Stuff like that, and, and I'm not sure uh, if, it, if it needs to be a sort of one, one system to rule them all. But anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, I want to get to your point. So my mom sort of piggybacks on what Carl okay. was saying is you're still relying on some sort of hardware to run this decentralized system. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what like Clear Center is doing with their Clear Node and they're retrofitting basically every single HP server brain that's being installed everywhere to run their Yeah, so Definity, they'll have full nodes, kind of like the normal miners. They're also going to have light clients, but it's a permissionless blockchain, and you can use more kind of commodity hardware, 
Um, is that? So you're still sort of dependent on users to be running yes. versus this thing being distributed. Well, are you saying that this other company is like going into a server that's already doing something that's being run by like a school system? And they're installing like another like underlying operating system so that pretty much all the new ones are getting this and they're in the process of pulling the old ones out and just putting new ones in. So and that, or putting clear OS. So that, that so that so that you're trying to say, but isn't that conceptualized in the sense that the company kind of can at any point like do a software? How many update? people run HP servers? It's not just one company. Yeah. Google's uh, running, Amazon's running, Amazon's running. But do they have to elect like a client say, hey, I want to like support this operating system and let it live on my server? Maybe it's based off of Linux and it's open source. I guess I, what I don't quite understand is you're saying that this one is like dependent on humans deciding to like install well, I was software. wondering like at what level it's at, whether if I want to support the blockchain, do I need to run the node or would it be running elsewhere? On another server, and that's where I take data from. Whether it's data or my my public key or whichever, what does the user have in control? Um, versus what do we need? What would someone need to support the network? That's a good question. At the user level, I'm not sure. I don't think they've come out with how that will work. But I mean, I think it's similar to Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's a public permissionless blockchain. And people can throw up mining nodes, and they'll have some kind of light client as well. And so, uh, I've heard that permissionless nature is probably the biggest distinction between the two systems you're describing. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, this HP system is not as permissionless as a system where anybody with any type of hardware that has reasonable resources could could do it. Right? It's not quite as public. It's it's kind of, but not not as much as that. Well, it's like I can run. Your OS on a smart hardware. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying it was only on HP servers. Well, they partnered with HP Thanks. to have nodes basically worldwide. I see. Just to access um, so, everything faster, easier, more distributed. Definity might, I mean, I've heard them in or seen in some slides that. Um, any kind of cloud providers that are losing tons of business to AWS or other services would be able to repurpose their hardware and just run <coughs> Definity nodes and gain them. I mean, same as, I, I, it's not, I don't think it's very much different than Bitcoin or Ethereum. Gotcha. So, I don't know. And then back to the point of whether we're gonna have a bunch of different world computers or not, I, it's just my personal belief in looking at history and what I want to happen as well. I want a single internet computer I don't want a ton of different choices if they're all in the same domain trying to accomplish the same thing. We don't need 10 different IP protocols. We only need one. But in a different domain, you need another protocol. TCP gives you that. In a different domain, you need another protocol. HTTP gives you that. And so I see it consolidating. I think there will be lots of competition at first, but I don't know. So, I just, so you don't think we need HTTP2 because HTTP is sufficient scale? Well, that's not really a different protocol. Sure it is. It has the same semantics. It has the same. All the servers, all the clients, they all have to be migrated. All the support. It's essentially a new protocol that is back. It has backwards compatibility because HTTP, although it was a great design when it was designed, it, it became obsolete and now it needs to be replaced. So the evolution of technology means that you will never have a single solution will have solutions that dominate for periods of time. So, okay, so, so I agree with there that. will always be overlapping solutions that are pushing the envelope. You know, the Definity guys, as smart as they are, haven't thought of everything or solved every problem. And they may continue to evolve to where they continue to be strong, but, but you know, there's going to be always be people pushing different envelopes. Yeah, but I agree. I agree with that. Not very many people are running token right now. Right? Yes, that's, yes. <laughs> not what? Sorry? So, so not very many people are running token right Yes. Now. As an example, I'm just like I'm oh. defending your position. Okay. Yeah. I'm saying <laughs> there is a consolidation around certain protocols. Yes. Yeah. So, did you have something? Oh, oh okay. Um, internet computer. 
So what do we get from this? I've talked about this already, simplified infrastructure. You write your business logic, you don't write your software infrastructure and, your, and deal with your hardware infrastructure. And you get all these awesome things for free, as in I don't have to spend the time, I guess, and the money uh, setting it all up. How? It really, at the core, is all about randomness. That's how you achieve security in these uh, giant decentralized systems that need to uh, come to consensus. For example, uh, if you think of, well, you guys probably know this, but if you have a bike lock and you want to keep somebody from stealing your bike, you, let's say you have four um, different little dials that you can switch. Each has nine digits that you can choose from, or 10 digits, zero to nine. There are about 10 to the four minus one possibilities that won't work, which is kind of a lot for at least someone trying to fiddle through it. There's one possibility that will work, and it's really that randomness, more or less. What I choose is, is random, and that provides the security on the bike lock. It's pretty much the same thing with proof of work uh, that Bitcoin and Ethereum are employing right now. Do we need to go over this? I think I should. I just think there are a lot of people that don't even know this at all. So, um, so this is a kind of a, a proof of work block header. It has the previous block header hash. That's kind of what creates the actual blockchain is that you can chain these things together. It has a difficulty target. That's a really huge 256-bit number. Well, yep, the difficulty target creates that number. And then you have a nonce. A nonce is just another 256-bit number. And in proof of work, here's how they achieve randomness. Every single node in the network um, is creating a block. As transactions come in, they're creating up the block body. And once they have enough transactions, and this, this is simplified, so they take their nonce, they start it at a certain number, we'll start ours at zero, and then we hash our block header. And we're gonna get a huge 256-bit number out of that. We take the number and we check it against the difficulty. If it's less than the difficulty, we win, and essentially we are chosen as the block producer. So we can take our block, propagate it throughout the network, and because we have the proof of work, which is the nonce, everyone can check, they can hash the header themselves, check it against the difficulty target, and then they will, if they're honest, they'll accept us. And if they're dishonest, they're gonna do whatever they want, but this proof of work provides the randomness that fights against that um, dishonesty. And so we're gonna keep going. We're gonna increment the nonce and hash it and check. And increment the nonce and hash it and check. And you just do that forever until you get a number that's less than your difficulty. Um, in Bitcoin, this gives us a block time of about 10 minutes, and the Bitcoin network actually tries to keep itself at that level, if I'm not mistaken. And you get finality in about six blocks. Finality means if you have a transaction, you can be pretty sure that the transaction won't be reversed or manipulated in some way. And probabilistically, after six blocks have been created in Bitcoin, the chance of the the feasibility of being able to change those transactions is really, really low. And so it's kind of a, a heuristic. This gives us finality in about one hour. So if I transact on Bitcoin, an hour later, I can be pretty sure that what I did is recorded forever. Ethereum is similar, but a lot, it's a lot better. You have about 20 second block times. Finality is maybe around 10 blocks and that gives you three minutes to finality. Um, some things about Bitcoin and Ethereum, their consensus is only probabilistic and it's not actually true finality. You'll never ever get to a 0% um, probability that somebody can change what happened. But what Definity proposes is that proof of work is not necessary to achieve security if you have an unpredictable and unmanipulable source of randomness. If you could somehow have some source of randomness that can't be changed and that no one can predict, 
then you don't need the proof of work. Essentially, that's what proof of work's trying to do. Um, so with Definity's consensus algorithm, you have a block time of about one second, and you reach finality in two blocks only, and that time to finality is about two seconds because two blocks, one second. And the cool thing about its finality is that it's actually final. It's true finality. It's like set in stone. It's not probabilistic. And now we'll get into the nitty gritty of the actual consensus algorithm. Okay, so I'm gonna give a high level overview. So in the Definity network, you have a network of nodes. Let's imagine we have a ton of nodes, maybe tens, hundreds of thousands, or maybe even a million nodes, okay? Each person who wants to join the network, so each of these nodes, has to stake a little bit of Definity token. And it's a special transaction. You stake it, and then the system registers you as a mining identity. And each mining identity um, has the same weight in the network, but you can own multiple mining identities. So a mining shop or whatever might have tons of identities that it controls. Okay, so everybody joins the network. Yep. Are there any restrictions on, I mean, because it's a, you could have like infinity amount of identities. I don't think there are any restrictions built into it that I know of. Um, you do have to stake token. So, as you can afford, yeah. Which I think, I haven't thought about too much, but I feel like that leads to centralization in some ways, so. Same thing with Bitcoin, though you have huge mining rigs. It kind of seems centralized because there's only a few block producers, but we'll talk about that, okay. So you stake some Definity, you get yourself a mining identity, you're registered on the network. Um, and then there is this unpredictable, unmanipulable source of randomness known as the random beacon. The random beacon is produced by a verifiable random function. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But right now, assume it just exists. It's, this, it's a 32-byte number, 256 bits. And what it does is it chooses groups. So it starts grouping everybody. And you have groups of 400 nodes. And it's chosen, the group size is chosen to ensure that half plus one of the group will be honest if at least two thirds of the entire population is honest. Is this beacon a central actor of some kind? No, it is completely, <coughs> it's unpredictable and unmanipulable, so it's not central. No one, you can't It, the, the network works together to, to produce the random beacon and to keep it going. Okay. And we'll get into that. Okay. Yes? Wait, so that how, how it gets around the nothingness state problem of proof of stake? Um, Where, like, you can just vote for, there's nothing stopping from people just voting for a whole bunch of different people, different actors. Like voting for who produces the block or something? Uh, probably. You, you don't really have control over that because of it's all, it's, there's like, it's super, yeah, it's, the randomness really drives everything that's about to happen. And so, okay, so we have this random beacon, a 256-bit uh, number. It starts creating groups of 400 nodes. And this is just a high-level overview, and we'll get into the slides. I just think it'll be better to hear a narrative first. Um, and the block production happens in rounds. So one round means one block is produced. And rounds are grouped together in epochs, or epics, or whatever, however you pronounce it. So for one round, you're going to have the random beacon, and the random beacon is going to select a group. That group becomes the notarization committee. So the beacon selects 400 nodes, okay? Those nodes, so as that's being selected, everybody in the network is building up blocks. So everybody's creating blocks. 
once they think they have a valid block, they're going to, this is according to my understanding, by the way, it might be, I don't know, slightly wrong, but like getting into the documentation that they don't have that much documentation. And so just a disclaimer. So, um, okay, so we're in a round. Everybody in the network is creating blocks and they start proposing blocks to each other and it starts propagating throughout the network. Meanwhile, the committee that has been chosen, those 400 nodes, they're listening for block proposals that are coming in. I left something out. The random beacon, not only does it select a group, it also ranks every single mining identity in a random way. It's called probabilistic slot consensus. It's the probabilistic slot protocol. And the random beacon will take every mining identity and rank them and give them a weight. And that's completely random. And so as blocks are coming in, the committee waits a certain amount of time. Once that time's up, it chooses the block with the highest weight, and that's random. The probabilistic slot protocol randomly chose the weights of all the identities. So it chooses the block um, whose creator has the highest weight. And then together, that committee will create signature shares of that block, and they will collectively sign the block. And this is known as a threshold signature. And so you only need a certain threshold of the group to create the signature on the block. Yes? Um, two questions. What mm -hmm. happens, what's stopping it from all 400 of those being controlled by one entity like the mining group? Just probability. So, um, prob if, so assuming two thirds of your network is honest, a group of 400 nodes, you have a high probability of half being honest. That's why it was selected. So in that case, um, yeah, so finality happens after two blocks. And so I think it would be cut because you would have to, you'd have to do that like many times in a row to really start hurting the network. And so the next time, I'd have to think through that. But I imagine the next time. Yeah, okay. So, because that may that bring me to, because the first one that we kind of got is that they're just assuming that, yeah, maybe random selection of 800 machines are not all going to go down. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the block, each block producer is only going to build on top of a node that they build on top of the heaviest chain, that weight being the combined weight of all the blocks and those weights coming from the random beacon ordering all the mining identities on each round. Okay, so we ordered the mining identities, we gathered block proposals, we, once the time comes, we choose the block with the highest weight, and then we generate a threshold signature, and we sign that block, and that becomes the notarization. And then we take that and we propagate it throughout the network, and everyone will take that block, and if it's notarized, they then we'll build upon it in the next round. And the next round gets chosen by taking the current random beacon, generating a threshold signature on that random beacon, and that threshold signature becomes the next number in the random beacon. So it's just a chain of 32 byte numbers all selected randomly. And, I yeah. I don't know if I'll even understand the answer if like, somebody can actually answer. Because I recently heard about Ethereum they, there was an Ethereum hack of a DAP that was trying to do a random number, and they were just like, you can't do random numbers on blockchains. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the point of this article. Um, do you have any idea how they're doing random numbers? I, I, so, I, I probably don't know enough about like, crypto. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, at the, that's at the DAP. Yeah. You it's, could have an oracle that is using a true random number generator somehow, right? 
But it sounds like it's it's the random seven. beacon is a signature. Right, so right. I'm just explaining. So it's it's, it's that a pseudo random number. I'm, so I'm just saying, theoretically, you could period. do this, right? Sam? That's a what? What's, what's the period for this? Because this random beacon, which is a signature of, a, of the previous beacon, the clock, mm -hmm. right? So, and all the IDs of all of the nodes, right? Although, if you have new nodes coming in, you're, inter you're potentially introducing new randomness because the node IDs could be generated with, with a, a, a true random noise generator. So, that might be how they solve the problem. Is they, they require the IDs of the nodes that contribute to the block to then become part of the signature. But if you just have fixed IDs that aren't changing, then it's just a pseudo random generator and it'll have a period when it'll start repeating. Well, if your initial... The period might be shown in some years, but it will have a period. If your initial source of randomness is truly random, and then you base everything else off of that... Then it's a pseudo random generator. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's like when you do SRAND, in the glibc library, right, you're seeding the pseudo-random number generation algorithm with some source that's thought to be more truly random. But, but after a while, that sequence of random numbers will repeat. That's called the period for mm -hmm. the random number generator. Some of those periods are billions long, right? But if you're doing, you know, a block every second, you're going to hit that billion mm -hmm. pass. That's interesting. I haven't heard anything about it, so I'd have to look into it. Yeah, so, so I don't think Divinity has some smart guys. I don't think it would do something that. Yeah. But it may not be well defined in the documentation. Yeah. How, how they're avoiding uh, the random beacon and the beacon kind of period. They yeah. have to have some source of randomness besides just signing blocks from pools of. Well, they're not signing blocks, they are signing well, the previous. Signing, yes, they're signing. They have a bunch of, they're doing a threshold signature, mm -hmm. which, which is still a pseudo random number, pseudo random. It's a, it's a verifiable random function. Right. Which, which is, is pseudo. Which is just take, it's still a pseudo random number generator, right? So it's just, a, so this is very similar to alpha random. Yes, yes. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, back to, um, oh, what was your name? My, my name was Robert. Yeah, yours. John, your question. So as far as I understand, that randomness uh, was coded into a smart contract, probably. And so when that smart contract has to get run on all the nodes in the entire network, the randomness might not be the same. And so that's where the bugs could come from. And that's not at the Ethereum protocol level. This randomness is driving the protocol. This isn't any user level code. So I think that's just a big difference. I think also you could have a situation where if people could predict the random number generation sequence that was being used, um, and it's easy enough to sort of like look at the contract code, it might be possible to like know given certain inputs what outputs are going to be produced in a way that could break things for some algorithms, you know, just in terms of like how the Ethereum exploit could have been done. Mm. I, I haven't read it in detail, but just as a thought. Yeah, but Definity shouldn't, at the protocol level, doesn't have that um, problem, I don't believe. Well, so at, at the end of the day, like I say, we're going to know that every second we for the, for, for, the, uh, for the beacon. No matter what you do, that's going to be a point of vulnerability for the network until somebody can figure out how to figure out that random number ahead mm -hmm. of the next beacon, and then they can co opt or take over the network. I assume. It, it's all built on top of it being unpredictable. But they don't have to do that without actual random. That's why the Cloudflare, mm -hmm. their HTTPS, no, their HTTPS random generators are wildlings because there is no way to computationally create randomness. So that's the only thing that, that would be obvious in the right? Well, also, yes. that's also the links. Maybe we should. Um, I, I think they have a way of doing that. They have really good cryptographers work for. Yeah, maybe so we should just pause just the discussion of randomness. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, let's keep going. So, randomness. If it's pseudo random, it's vulnerable, but I think Definity's implementation is probably pretty good. 
Um, okay, so now I'll just get into everything I just talked about at the high level. So you have your identity layer. Each miner needs to register on the network. You obtain a mining identity. You stake Definity tokens. That stake amount is, is equivalent per identity. And you, if you're a miner, you can have many identities. And this is just a technical point. You're only activated after two epochs, and epoch is a number of rounds. A round is you create like one block per round. Uh, the random beacon, it's a simple chain of random numbers, 32 bytes each. Each number is the BLS threshold signature of the preceding number, like I said. It's a verifiable random function produced jointly by group members, and only a threshold K of N members are necessary to create the signature. This is what helps us get around the fact that there could be dishonest members in your group. The random beacon is the one that creates the groups. Groups consist of 400 nodes each. That guarantees that, I mean, I already said that, half of the members, assuming two thirds of the network is honest. Here's kind of how it works visually. So if you have n equals 10, and you need at least half the group plus one, then you'd have k equals six. Here's the current 32-bit random number. You only need a threshold of the group to sign the randomness. So anyone could do it. Everybody creates a signature share of that number, and then boom, they sign the next random number that's gonna go choose the next group, that's gonna do the probabilistic slot protocol and weight the miners, and it's gonna actually do the notarization of the blocks so that you know your block is the one that has been chosen. And so it just kinda moves forward like this. It's known as threshold relay. At the blockchain layer, um, and this is probably not exactly how it looks, but you have your block height, you have a hash to the previous header. You don't have that nonce and that difficulty anymore because we're not doing proof of work. Instead, you have a notarization, which is going to be the signature that the notarization committee signed. And you're not gonna build on top of a block unless you have that signature. Um, this is the probabilistic slot protocol that I talked about in each round. You rank everybody in a random order. The random order is derived from the random beacon. You assign a weight to all the block proposals based on the ordering of the mining identity that created it. And you should always give favor to the heaviest chain, being the accumulated block weight. Um, and all this results in a constant block time and prevents race conditions between the miners. And we, I guess we've already talked about all this. The threshold group signs the random beacon. They also notarize the heaviest block, and then they broadcast that notarized block. And the last thing I wanted to do was to show the testnet video, which kind of shows you the testnet in action. Welcome to Finishing Fans, and thank you for watching. Today, we've got a real treat for you. I'm going to give you a peek at the Definity Test Network that we use to play with our blockchain computer technology. This applies new cryptography to create a public blockchain that is extraordinarily fast and more secure than anything around today. This, of course, is the foundation for the Definity World Computer. This is a virtual computer that's created by an open network that can increase its capacity on demand that we hope will host much of the world's business logic and data. The Definity computer is unstoppable and tamper-proof and makes it possible to create business systems that are much more secure, much more reliable, and are highly interoperable, all at a fraction of the cost. Definity will also host general dApps, decentralized finance, decentralized social media systems, and large-scale open source businesses that compete with traditional intermediaries such as Uber and eBay. This is the future cloud. With these thoughts in mind, let's get started. So here we are. This is the Definity test network. I'll cycle through the panels quickly to give you a quick overview. Network shows the nodes in the network that are collaborating to create the virtual computer. Uh, there are 500 of them. They're distribu distributed around the world in places like Singapore and London. Uh, currently, we're using Amazon spot instances uh, to keep the costs down. Um, 
The recent blocks uh, are, as you imagine, blocks being produced by the network are coming out at a furious rate. Uh, test networks uh, exceeded 2.5 million blocks at this time. RAM beacon is the RAM number being produced by the current group. Uh, it's used to select the next group and it's also used to drive all of the protocols we use. So there's a single threshold relay that's actually fundamental to all of the definition protocols and it produces um, the world's first unstoppable, unmanipulable, unpredictable randomness without any trusted parties. And we use this very special sequence of random numbers to drive all of our protocols. So you could really um, say that you know Definity involves uh, lots of theories about how random numbers are applied. Block height uh, gives you the current block height and the time taken to create the current uh, block. Latency chart you know, graphs that out, so you can see that blocks are coming out every half second uh, on this test network. Now this is the uh, this is where it gets really interesting. So Definity in normal operation produces finality in two blocks. Okay? So that means we're reaching finality, you know, new computations are finalized in one second. Now to put that in perspective, uh, Bitcoin requires six blocks and the block time is 10 minutes. So in expectation, it finalizes transactions in 60 minutes. Can take a bit longer, can take less. Ethereum requires 37 blocks, you know, block time is about 15 seconds, so that works out as 10 minutes or 600 seconds to finalize computations. That is when you, you know, say for example you're running a financial exchange on Ethereum and you submit an order and you, know, you think it's executed. You've got to wait 10 minutes before you can be sure, sure the network hasn't reorganized and that trade has really gone through. Um, on Divinity, we're producing finality in a second on this test network. We'll detune it for the, the production network, but you know, this is running 600 times faster than Ethereum is today. So let's get back to the network and some of the really exciting uh, things about that. Uh, the green dots show you the current group that is collaborating to produce the current block and also select, create a random number that selects the next group. The fat green dot is the um, individual node that is in fact acted as a leader and proposed a block that's been accepted by the group, which is then notarized. So let's uh, click on one of these, uh, oops, try and click on one of these, what well, are so fast? Oops. Here we go. Um, okay, so we've one of these blocks um, flying past, and let's go through the, the fields. Block height needs no explanation. Test networks produce just over two and a half million blocks. Uh, beacon, that's the random number produced by the previous group that selected the current group. And there's a priority order on all the nodes in the network that might want to um, be the leader uh, and, and propose a block. Notarization is a threshold signature created by the group on the block. And notarization is nothing essential to this thing called probabilistic slot consensus. It is um, a process by which we drive much faster consistency and also remove problems like selfish mining and nothing at stake. Timestamp time stamp needs an explanation. Minter, this just means that if you took all of the nodes in the network, uh, all of them lexicographically by the public keys. Uh, it was no 194 that acted as the leader to produce the block. That group 99 accepted and notarized. So we can look at the group members here. There's only 100 uh, members in, in each group. Um, the reason for that is um, uh, we um, only have 500 nodes in, in the network. It wouldn't make sense to run, run larger groups. But in the production network, Group size will be 400. Okay, let's flip across to Contra. Okay, that's essentially it. Um, so, I think Definity is an excellent project. It's, I think, either Ethereum, Definity, or potentially a successor after that is going to essentially solve the world computer problem and create something that we can build on for the next 10, 20, or 30 years. And,
that's that's pretty much it. Any questions at the end? So how are the nodes picked? How do you become a node? The random beacon chooses. Oh, how do you become a miner? Yeah. Uh, you'll so they don't have the software out yet, but you'll be able to download the SDK or whatever. You missed the, you missed the very beginning. Yeah. Yes. He missed the part where you explained oh. about just staking. Yeah. Okay. So you're gonna need to get a certain number of Definity tokens. I don't know how much. You'll need hardware that's good enough to provide um, to, to satisfy the requirements of the network, and you stake some coin, put your node up. If your node fails to perform well, you're going to be penalized. And so you need to make sure that you have good enough hardware to do it. But that's essentially the process, I imagine. Good enough hardware. I don't know. Uh, it, sounds like, it sounds like um, if it performs, like it'll, if it gets put in the group of random and it like doesn't give a response fast enough, mm -hmm. then it'll say, oh, this wasn't good enough. Who knows if it was because of the internet connection or I'm sure there are multiple reasons why. Yeah. If you're running on AWS, I don't know. I'm sure there's multiple reasons why you're yeah. working on that. On Infinity's website, they actually have like an amateur setup and a pro setup. <coughs> on the amateur, they talk about having a microphone. <laughs> and then the pro, like, well, maybe you start the cloud and then you go from there. Well, you'll probably need pretty good bandwidth, pretty good storage, and some good enough processing. So, what's Infinity's plan to get adopted? Like, what's their strategy? So, um, right now, they're kind of just traveling throughout the world presenting at meetups and stuff. They have pretty good funding. They have a community fund, kind of like Ethereum has. Um, I think they're, I've read that they are planning some kind of compatibility with EWASM contracts. So. How are the tokens gonna be distributed? How will they be distributed? So they already are doing an airdrop for people who aren't US residents or citizens because of the SEC and mm -hmm. all the legal issues around that. So they're gonna airdrop it to a bunch of people and then I imagine at network launch, so it'll probably just be on exchanges. Have they already raised funding? They have Andreas and Horowitz, Polychain Capital, and I think a few others. They have, I think that was a $61 million raise. And then I think it's, I think they have a few other sources as well. How, how do they not consider themselves an Ethereum competitor? I don't get that. Um, I guess maybe it's their, I don't know, maybe it's their attitude. They don't necessarily want to crush them. They, they, maybe it's they like Ethereum. They've learned from Ethereum. They hope Ethereum takes what they've learned and puts it in. Maybe, maybe the healthy competition. Well, their focus is both 3.0 and smart contracts. Or a currency. Or a currency. Yeah. So, so, you know, smart contracts require an additional layer of infrastructure that Definity does provide. Definity just provides fast distributed consensus. And then uh, uh, computation on top of that. Well, it's, 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 but the computation is not the same as smart contract computation. So yeah, smart contract computation is everybody sees the same computation. It's a single computation that everybody comes to consensus on. Whereas if you're just doing normal work for computation that's private, then it's, it's everybody's doing their own computation. I, but it's provided to you as a service, that's what you're saying, right? Well, I think it's essentially going to be the same. But is it verifiable, like, in a way that anyone can see the out? Like, the state of this global computer can I, be viewed by anybody? I believe so. Okay. I cut the video off, and he started doing some contract type stuff. Oh, state. Okay. Cool. Um, we could watch it if you want. It's like, what about storage? Like, um, so I'm hearing a lot about computation, but uh, uh, can you store large amounts of data on this? Yeah, so in his demo, he hosted his entire app's front end in a contract, more or less. And the contract had a few fields. One was like HTML, had all his HTML in. And then, what about um, storage in, as in personal data storage? So you've got several users of your system, right? And each user wants to have some sort of encrypted uh, set of uh, profile settings or preferences that is unique to them, right? Or da data that's unique to them or their, their company. Uh, yeah, how does that happen? So I've been super curious about that question. Okay. Because 
for the things that I'm building. I really, really, really want a decentralized backend that can store private data and even run private computations. So I've asked around, and there's nothing in their official documentation or anything, but they have said they're working on a concept that is a crypto black box, more or less, running on the protocol that would allow <coughs> private computation of, of data. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, it's kind of a question that was brought up in my mind. It doesn't exactly relate to Definity, but Definity caused me to have it. And it's about blockchain in general. I was thinking about how often they have blocks, and I was thinking about the size. Again, I'm coming back to this like, right now, Ethereum is only X years old and it's already 100 gigabytes. So, like in 50 years, or maybe that's me dreaming that the technology will last for 50 years. And it's like, it really only has to last for 20 years or something. But say in 20 years, um, it's like ginormous amounts of data. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's anybody working on like how to handle yeah. huge amounts just to run a full node? It seems like it piles up infinitely. It know? seems like the solution that people are all coming to is sharding. So Ethereum's working on sharding. Definity has a sharding concept, I believe, and so so Definity does nothing to reduce the the overall size of the blockchain and it's, it, it settles more quickly but it's still just as much data as say Ethereum or something somebody else is producing. Yeah probably except you can I think they had some concept of changing the state as in being able to delete things. Hmm. I'm not sure. So yeah. I mean Ethereum holds the state of the, the current state of the computer but then the blockchain itself holds like the entire history of all changes that have been made to the state so that you can reproduce those if you wanted to. Um, and there are several concepts for compressing the size of a blockchain by just saying like, we don't need to keep track of all past history, right? We can sort of play it as it goes as we're getting, to the <coughs> present, we're getting closer to the present time. But once we've established a uh, once we've proven that the blockchain is sound, we could discard a lot of that old history and only keep track of the current present state. So there are some things you can do, but it still... Yeah, I think big. a lot of this is getting into the actual, well, the actual computation, which they have a concept of a hypervisor that's really going to be sitting on top and really controlling all the computation of all the nodes. There's something called Primea, which is like contract to contract or actor to actor communication in a decentralized way. And so there's all kinds of hmm. amazing things that I believe they're working on that uh, I, I don't know about yet. Okay. But really, it's going to be, based on everything I've heard, it is going to be a general purpose world computer. And so if you want to store data, you can. If you want to compute on data, you can. And I'm hoping to replace entire backends with something like Definity. So. Are they thinking about using the concept of like gas, or is that just there's gas? Okay. Yep. So they are using some sort of a cost. Yep. Well, thanks a lot for coming out. Yeah.